Praise God. Exodus chapter 19, uh, verses 16 to 20. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. You may be seated this morning. We have carefully choreographed and uh, invested time and energy into mentioning the word mountain countless times to you today. In worship and an activity, we've planned this activity for months and months, knowing that I was going to preach on the God of the mountain today. I'm just teasing. But I am, I am telling you this. Every time you hear the word mountain for the next month, uh, that was because Sky Burl uh, went ahead and sponsored that for me, that you'd think about this message every time you hear the word mountain. So thank you for all the advertisement, Sky, that you're paying for. We appreciate you. <laughs> Look, some people like to climb mountains. I may not be the best one to speak on this topic. But they do it for exercise, maybe adventure, the sense of accomplishment, or maybe just for the view. In fact, we did have a group of people, Pastor Paul mentioned it, we had a group of people that went and hiked that mountain. Make a little noise if you hiked that mountain yesterday. And I believe we've got a, a couple pictures from that hike. No, not quite yet. Let's, let's back up. Yeah, that was the top, but there it is. There's Matt Pellerin. Matt Pellerin leading the way. Hallelujah. Man. Yeah, and, uh, you know, they really had to face the elements yesterday, you know, but they traversed and they they conquered. They Look, there they are. They're they're making it up to the summit. And finally, ah, there they are. There they are. What a great job. Come on, give it up for these people that hiked Borstone Mountain yesterday. You know, I think that uh, Borstone is, it ranks right up there, just shy of Mount Everest as far as height, is what I'm told. I heard from some of you that said it really felt like it (laughs) on the way up and on the way down. But Mount Everest is the tallest mountain in the world, standing at 29,031 feet. Currently, about 6,000, just over 6,000 people have summited Mount Everest. Also, a little over 300 people have lost their lives trying to make it to the top of that mountain. You know, not everyone makes it to the top of the mountain. But people will invest time and energy and resources, training and doing all the different things, you know, to invest to try to get to the top of that mountain. The typical cost, I, I found that it's somewhere between sixty and hundred thousand dollars that people invest if they want to try to make it to the top of Mount Everest. I think that people just love the challenge. They like to face that adversity and know that they can conquer that mountain. Now, although not everyone makes it to the top, I heard one expert, he said this, generally speaking, people that don't make it to the top of the mountain. Most people who fail to reach that summit have probably, listen to this, underestimated the mountain and overestimated their own ability. There's things that you face in life that you think, I can do this one on my own. You've underestimated the power that God has for you to accomplish what he's called you to do, and maybe you've overestimated your own strength and ability. Have you ever met somebody that maybe they seem like they've got it all together? I don't need any help. Look straight ahead. 
But sometimes we face things in our lives that we need strength and we need direction and we need provision and we need the faith to make it through and to conquer different things that come our way. Today, I want to talk to you about this topic, the God of the mountain. You know, maybe you don't climb physical mountains, but maybe there's some things in your life that you've accomplished that you're proud of. I mean, look, I, I got a few things that I'm proud of. I, I've been married to my high school sweetheart for 16 years. Hey, she loves attention. Everybody look at her and clap. We've got three wonderful boys growing up to be amazing young men. I'm so proud of that. You know, I ran my own business for 14 years before coming on staff here full time, which honestly, that was great. But coming here and working here and doing God's work has been a lifetime goal that I had. Some other things that I've accomplished, like last week, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I drank a whole gallon of water in one day. I mean, I was, thank you, thank you, yes, hydration, hey, it's good. I was so proud of that. Next up, maybe I can do it two days in a row, Alex, what do you think? Maybe I can do that. But maybe you've got some things you've accomplished, and maybe there's some things in life that you're still hoping to accomplish, and you're asking the Lord for guidance and direction. I want to show you today as we speak on the God of the mountain, that God is calling you to spend some time with him on the mountain. And on that mountain, you're going to find some things about the Lord. On the top of the mountain, you'll find that God gives direction. In Exodus chapter 19, we see that God has descended down on this mountain. And he's speaking to Moses and he's speaking to the people and you know, the Israelites have just been released from captivity through the leadership of Moses. He's led them out now into the wilderness. And they need some direction. <laughs> have you ever been at a point in your life where you've just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know the next step to take. God's a God that will give you direction. God gave Moses specific instructions for him and the people. And you know, just days later after hearing these instructions. Now, we just read the scripture of what that scene looked like. God on the mountain, there's smoke and fire and thunder and the ground is shaking. And these people are so scared. The Israelites, look, look, Moses, look, look, we're going we're gonna to stand back here. You go listen to what God has to say. You tell us. We'll listen to you, okay? We don't let God talk to us. We're going to die. We're going to straight out die if he talks to us. They're scared, and they see this incredible, I mean, there's there signs and wonders, and wow, it's God on that mountain. It's more than the man on the mountain down in New Hampshire that you guys, some of you have seen. This is God. And it's just an incredible visual. And yet, just days later, you know, Moses goes up and down a few times, getting instruction, brings it back to the people. And then he, he goes up into the mountain to be with God, to spend time with God, to get direction from God. And he's up there for 40 days listening to all the instruction that God has for him. And by the time he comes back down, the Israelites have already forgotten what they'd seen. They'd already forgotten the direction that was given to them through Moses from God. And they turned their back away. They decided to serve other gods. They created a golden image and let's worship this. Why do you, how? how? <laughs> Has anybody wondered, how did you leave that so soon? I mean, I get it. Like, there's times, have you ever, I've had conversations with people. Keep your hand down, wife. Uh, I've had conversations with people, and, and they'll tell me something. Oh, yeah, 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 good. Got it. Roger that. 10-4 copy. <laughs> yeah, you know, got it. And I'll turn around and forget every word that that person just said. i got to retrace my steps. i got to walk back into that room. And I, what, what, did they, what was I? What did you want me to do? But God bellowed out in a loud commanding voice to these people. Like, there's fire. The ground's shaking. And uh, 
that, that's, I think that God is showing us here, and I want to point this out to you today. The reason that they didn't remember the voice of God is because they had a base of the mountain experience and not a mountaintop experience with the Lord. Going to church is so important for a Christian. In fact, it's vital that you attend church consistently, that you get into small groups, that you get together with a group of people and hike up a mountain together. That's what God wants for his body of believers, right? But if you just try to play a Sunday to Sunday game with God, you're going to forget the instruction that you've received while you're in the presence of God. You need to have your own mountaintop experience. Don't settle for the base of the mountain. Don't settle for second best. Don't just take my word for it. Don't just take Pastor Paul's word for it. Don't just take Pastor Ward's word for it. Get into the word of God and spend quality time with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lift him up in glory. Worship his name. Invite his presence to dwell inside of you. Don't settle for a base of the mountain experience. On the top of the mountain, you'll find that God gives direction. You'll also find at the top of the mountain that God provides. In Genesis chapter 22, we find Abraham. Abraham has been called by God. You see, Abraham already got direction from God. Abraham was told, I want you to get up, take your family, take your belongings, and go to the place that I'm going to show you. You know, I think that was preparation for what happened in chapter 22. God told him again, I'm going to have you do something. I'm going to have you go to this mountain. He's about to have a mountaintop experience. In fact, looking through, thumbing through the pages, I think this is really the first mountaintop experience that we see God having with somebody is with Abraham. Let's look at Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early, like any good man would do, get up early in the morning, hallelujah, make preparations. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with, God, with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told his servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. Think about this. With me, if you will. Every time I read this scripture, I, I, I have to put myself in the shoes of Abraham. This is a man who through his faith was counted as righteous by God. This is a man who tried to do it on his own and fulfill God's promise on his own way. But then God, you know, okay, it's okay. You made a mistake, but I am going to bless you now. And he gave Abraham that son Isaac with his wife Sarah. The blessing. This is how God was going to bless him. And now God wants him to sacrifice the answer to prayer. The fulfillment of a promise. Isaac. And, and I'm thinking this. You know, I think today if Abraham, this is like, you know, this is 2022 or, or something around here. Abraham gets this uh, moment in prayer with God, and God tells him to do this. I can just picture Abraham then going to his vlog and uh, recording this, you know, uh, you know, with a quick, like, phone. He's kind of like, hey, so I had a really weird time in prayer with God last night, and uh, I'm not really sure what's going to happen, but, you know, he's faithful. We're going to go ahead and see how this plays out. He gets in the morning, he's ready to go, and... And he goes back, and, and Abraham, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're going. Now, look, look, I, I think every time that I think about this, I think, Abraham, it was a quick thing. Sacrifice your son. Okay, yeah, sure, give me an axe. You know, no. 
This is a planned. He made preparations for this trip. He had to get people to come with him. He had to get supplies and resources. He had to chop the wood. He had to all these different things to get ready. And this is an intentional trip. This isn't just, you know, I'm going to hop in the car and, and, you know, drive to Bangor. This is, we're going to make some arrangements here. And day one comes, and he's, he's on the move. And I think at this point, if he's, he, you know, Abraham's like, okay, like still a little bit in disbelief here, uh, but uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going we're gonna to keep on going. I still can't believe God has asked me to do this, but, you know, we're going to keep on going. And he's every step of the way, every step of the way, every step of the way, I think he's wondering, God, I, I know that you've been faithful to me in the past. I wonder if he's reminding himself, God has got a history of showing up for me. I, I know the word God gave me, but I, this doesn't look like the result I thought it was going to look like. And every step of the way, wondering and building up his faith, but still being challenged and what's happening here. Day two rolls around. I mean, he's like, okay, this is not what? Maybe a little bit angry, but still holding strong. He finally, on the third day, he gets there and in faith, he speaks to his servants <laughs> right there. And verse five, I think it is. You stay here. We're going to go up and worship and we'll be right back. We will be right back. He's got the faith still built, even though his situation looked a little bit gloomy, even though things didn't, weren't working out quite the way you thought they were. I'm going to encourage you to keep on speaking in faith. No, God told me that every one of my needs were going to be supplied. I'm standing on that word. I don't care what my bank account looks like. I don't care, you know, what, the, what right now with the, the people in my family who aren't serving Christ, I don't care that what the situation looks like now. I'm believing that they are going to come home. And in some time, they're going to be sitting with me in church. I believe that my family is going to be set free. I believe that every one of my needs will be provided. I believe the word of God. And Abraham says, we'll be right back. And he, and he goes up and praise God for the third day. Praise God for the third day when God provides. He gets up, he gets up to this mountain and he's got his, he has his son carry the wood for the fire. That's such a dad thing, isn't it? All right, I'm going to kill you. Here's the wood. <laughs> Carry it up that mountain. I got that back. You know, I got that knee. It's a football injury. Just don't worry. Just go ahead and grab the wood. And they go up. And, and the Bible says that he, he, you know, Isaac is like, Dad, we've, we've got the fire. We've got the wood, but we don't have a sacrifice. And I believe a certain level of faith rose up inside of Abraham when he said, God will provide a sheep in verse 8. Because he, I believe he was prophesying to his son, he was prophesying to himself, and he was prophesying to you and I that God is going to provide a spotless lamb, one that can be the redemption of our sins, and he can live in glory, in victory for you and I. But he still has to tie up his son and put him on the altar. Yeah, you, know, you think about that real quick. Oh, yeah, no, well, of course, why wouldn't? No, no, look. He had to tie his son down. I'm sure there was a little bit of a, a fight. I think I was about eight years old, and I had a little wart on my chin. You wouldn't see it now if I had one. But I went to the doctor, and I remember sitting there, and they're like, we're going to, you know, like, I, I didn't really know what was going to happen. Just like, oh, they got to look at this, you know, put some medicine on it, you know, whatever, like little, you know, I don't know, rubbing alcohol or something on my chin, and we'll be good. And the doctor got this crazy look in his eye, and he says, go get the scissors. Whoa, baby, I'm out of there. Uh -uh, I am not playing your game, man. And I'm like, ah! you know, I'm just like, you couldn't hold me down. They had to call in the National Guard, and it was this whole thing. They had to, they had to wrestle me down and pin me. <laughs> and they finally snipped that stupid thing off, and my mother won't forget this day. I'm just, oh, that didn't hurt. <laughs> There was like four or five nurses and doctors, and they're like all rolling their eyes like, oh, my word, would you parent this kid, you know? <laughs> but can you imagine Isaac? Dad's got the fire, and he's got a knife. Like, I don't think he was sitting still. And Abraham's faith held out. Like, I know God's going to provide, and I don't get too stuck on the resource that you take your eyes off your source. 
Don't hold on to the blessing so tightly that you forget about the one who's blessing you. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Because on that third day, God showed up. And God provided on that mountaintop for Abraham with a, bu- with a ram in the bushes. He said, don't lay a finger on that child. I know that you won't even hold your own son for me. Now I'm going to provide for you. And in that moment, what a picture of what Christ did for us. God asked Abraham to give up his own son. And because Abraham didn't hold back even his own son, God didn't hold his own son back from us. He gave his son for us to give his life on the cross, to shed his innocent blood so that you and I can be made free and whole in Jesus' name. Praise God. On the top of the mountain, you'll find that not only does God give direction, but he provides. He also will build your faith. God brings you to mountaintops, I think, to adjust your vision, your focus, and your perspective. You see, the thing about the mountaintop experience is that really this is a time for you to spend with the Lord in prayer, in worship, Set that time aside that you can have these times alone. Not, you know, look, we're going to have a time here in this altar, and that's great. But I'm telling you, your mountaintop experience happens when you're in your own room, when you're in your prayer closet, wherever it is that you pray at home. If you don't have a place in your home, make a place in your home that you can spend time in prayer. Listen to the Lord. Allow him to speak to you. Worship his name. But God will build your faith in these times. Because oftentimes we get focusing on the wrong mountain. We start focusing on our problems and we stop focusing on the one who can fix our problems. The one who can set us free. The one who provides. So in Mark chapter 9, Jesus took three of his disciples up on a mountain. And uh, he took Peter, James, and John. He left the rest of the disciples down low and he went up there. And they start going to this time of prayer, and all of a sudden, something crazy happens, and Jesus starts his clothes to start transforming, like on Hunger Games or something, when she just went, like in her dress kind of flew out. But uh, Jesus' robe turned, none of you know what I'm talking about, come on. (laughs) Jesus' robe turned like this dazzling white. It wasn't that he had some sort of tied, you know, stain stick in his pocket. There was no spray and wash available at the time. He went, whoo, his clothes were white. And all of a sudden, Elijah and Moses show up out of nowhere. And the disciples are a little bit wigging out at this point. Have you ever opened your mouth when you should have just kept your mouth closed? Don't give me that look in the front row, I'm telling you. (laughs) Have you ever, like, gotten nervous? How many of you, when you get nervous, you clam up and don't say anything? Wow. (laughs) Okay, I'm scared to ask this. How many of you get nervous and you say too much? Okay, and some of you are just liars or don't want to participate. That's fine. But sometimes, something, Peter, he says, okay, he's in the middle of all this, and he sees, you know, the, the wardrobe change, and he sees the, the prophets show up, and he's like, wow, this is so great that we're here. Like, uh, what can I do for you, Jesus? How about I, uh, let me build you a little tool shed over here, a little, you know, a little outhouse, or like a, you know, this is so, a she shed, what do you want? Can I, can I build you guys something? Like, he didn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, this cloud covers them, and this voice, that same voice I think that Moses heard on the mountaintop. He says, this is my dearly beloved son. Listen to him. Do what he says. It's in this mountaintop experience. See, sometimes we go to the mountaintop and we just want to talk to God the whole time. But God wants to talk to you on this mountaintop. And when he does that, he wants to build your faith. And they came down from this mountain. And so Jesus has his disciples. They come down and the rest of the disciples are at the foot of the mountain and of course, Peter's just like still, you know, like, whoa, man, this is incredible up there. And they come down, and, and there's this man. He's brought his son. He's demon-possessed. And so Jesus says, what, what's going on here? And he says, well, you know, like he's, this demon keeps like throwing him into fire and water. And like this, it, it, you know, it's been going on for a long time. And I brought him looking for you, and I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't find you, and, and they couldn't cast this evil spirit out. So let's look here in verse 21. Mark chapter 9, verse 21, how long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire and into water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. 
What do you mean if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. That's such a powerful statement. I found myself saying that at times, God, I I believe you. I I know what your word says. I've read it. I know what you've done. And and I've seen it in my life, and I've seen it there, but this is a new thing. I haven't haven't faced this before. I know that you can do this, but help me to believe that you're actually going to do this for me this time around. You know, God doesn't, he doesn't scold you for your lack of faith. He gives you an opportunity to build your faith. I believe that somebody is here today that maybe your faith has been damaged. The situation that you're facing right now, your your focus is on the problem. And it's not on the Lord. And you just felt like there was a hole in the bottom of that faith bucket. I think God's about to do something to boost your faith today. In Jesus' name. (laughs) In Jesus' name. God can do in a moment, what you'll never be able to accomplish on your own. You haven't got to do this on your own because my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Praise God. So in verse 25, when Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed through the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out the evil spirit? Jesus said, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. God's calling you to the mountain today. God's calling you. Maybe you've been on the mountain. Maybe you've stayed at a lower level, and God says, I want you to come up a little bit farther. I want you to spend a little bit more time in prayer. I long to spend time with you on the mountain. And as you do, I'm telling you, your faith will rise, and you'll be able to handle things with the strength of the Lord that you cannot do on your own. On the top of the mountain, you'll find that God builds your faith. And I like this part because as that happens, as your faith builds, you know, I haven't, I've gone through things, I've faced things. I look around this room, people have faced some things that it required an awful lot of faith to get through. Can I? tell you that not a day goes by when I all of a sudden need less faith. I need more. There's not a day that goes by that I need less of the Spirit of the Lord within me. Every day I need more. I need more. I'm hungry for the Spirit of God. I'm hungry for the things of God. I'm hungry for His Spirit. I want God inside of me. I want to be able to have a moment in prayer every day where God does something fresh and new and stirs my spirit and speaks to me and shows me revelation. And and he just tells me everything's going to be all right. If you keep on following me, I'm going to give you direction. If you keep on coming up to this mountain, I'm going to give you that provision. And every day that you spend time with me, every moment, every hour that you spend with me, I'm going to raise your faith Because there's going to be some mountains that come up that want to face you and stand in your way. And God says, you don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to find another way around. You don't even have to climb this mountain. You know, on the mountaintop, you're going to find that God moves mountains. God moves mountains. The God of the mountain moves mountains. He moves mountains for you and I today. Musicians, you can come up and help me if you will. In Mark chapter 11, verses 22 and 23, then Jesus said to the disciples, this is just after a little bit. Now, in Matthew chapter 17, this account happens right together. He comes down from the mountain, casts that demon out of that little boy, and he tells them, listen, he says, 
If you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could tell this mountain to be lifted up and be cast out. Go somewhere else. Mark, Mark records this in chapter 11. Have faith in God, he says. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. I think God's telling you today. There's a couple of things. But I wonder if the time has come for you to stop climbing the mountains that you were never supposed to climb. God says, stop climbing that mountain of depression. God says, stop climbing that mountain of anxiety. Stop climbing that mountain of past hurt. Stop climbing that mountain of bondage. Stop climbing that mountain of addiction. Stop climbing that mountain of restless nights. Stop climbing that mountain of disease. Stop climbing that mountain. All those things don't belong to you. That's not your battle to face. You know, some people say, that's, that's, just, the, that's just my lot in life. That's what I deal with. Everybody's got their thing. No. The price that Jesus pray, paid on Calvary paid that price. You don't have to keep paying that price. Hey. Oh, I feel God in this place. It's time to stop climbing those mountains that you are never designed to climb. Climb the mountain to meet with Jesus. Climb the mountain to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Climb the mountain to spend more time with him day in and day out. It's time to stop putting so much faith into the problem. See, sometimes we get to the base of the mountain. Look, I can picture two mountains right now. The Israelites are at the base of the mountain. They saw God. They saw how powerful he was. They saw how big he was. We're not, we can't do it. Like, we can't speak to him. You know, maybe, maybe you used to be a part of this church. Maybe you followed the Lord. And you say, I can't. Okay, it's great. The mountaintop, wow, great. I, I can't even go up the beginner's trail. I've tried it before. I, I'm just not good enough. Can I help somebody today? You don't have to be good enough. My God's more than enough. He's come to this place today to tell you, I want to spend time with you. Just come meet me on this mountain. I'm gonna, you don't have to make it all the way to the top right away. I'm going to come down. I can meet with you. I can guide you step by step. God wants to meet you on the mountain today, but maybe, you know, sometimes you're looking up the mountain of the relationship with God. It seems daunting. You think, like, you can't do it. You haven't got to be perfect, okay? You haven't got to be perfect. But then there's this other mountain, and it's the problems that you're facing in life, and it's like, that's too big. I can't. Look at the size of that. I can't do it. I'm not big enough. You see all these problems over here, this mountain experience that you're facing? That one, you're focusing on yourself and your problems. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. That's way more than I, everybody in my family struggle with the same thing. That's my mountain to climb. Mm. God says, forget it. Forget about that mountain. Because in just a few minutes, we're going to find out that, where that mountain's about to go. But God says, just come up here. Look, look, the view's a lot better over here. If you come up to this mountain, spend time with me, I'll show you that 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 mountain, you can come up here on Mount Everest with me and look at that mountain that you've been staring at. It's no bigger than Charleston Hill. Come on. That's nothing. That's nothing according to the power of God. The things that you're facing, it's not, look, I, I, I hear you. Like I, You face stuff, man. It's not easy. It's not easy in our own strength. But Paul delights in his weakness because he knows that, look, I, I'm weak. But in my weakness, I'm going to boast because I know that when I'm weak, then he can become strong. It's not by power. It's not by might. But it's by the Spirit of God. Zechariah 4, verses 6 and 7. Then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force, nor by strength, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. Praise God. Will you stand with me this morning?
praise God. Praise God. Would you just begin to lift your voice in worship before they start to sing? Just begin to declare how good our God is. Father, we worship you. Come on, let there be a sacrifice of praise here this morning. Let your praise, let your worship rise up to the throne room of God like an incense in his altar. God, we praise you, we worship you. Come on, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Father, we praise your name. <laughs> You're the God of the mountain. You're the God of more than enough. You're the God of direction. You're the God of provision. And you're the God who increases my faith. You're the God that gives me the power to speak to the mountain, to be he removed. Get out of my way. I don't need to mess with you anymore. You are the God who can make those mountains a highway for your people. God, we praise you. God, we give you glory. Hallelujah. Keep singing, guys. Keep singing a little bit. Praise God. Worship him this morning. I feel God giving us two calls today. Praise God. Man, isn't he good? Number one, 
God's calling you up the mountain. I don't know where you're at in your walk with Christ. But I do know that God's calling you a little bit higher up that mountain. Maybe you're still at the base of the mountain, allowing other people to tell you what God's saying. Man, just start climbing that mountain. You don't have to have it all figured out on day one. Look, if you haven't got a Bible, I'll give you one. Open this Bible. Begin to read the written word of God that's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. You ever need to hear from God? Crack open this book. He's already said it. It's powerful. Read, read the word. But spend some time in prayer. Look, I, I, look we all live a, a busy life. Your schedule's full. You've got all kinds of things going on. You've got to get the kids here, the kids there. You've got to get to work. You've got to run reports. you get all all these things. But I'm telling you, There's certain things in life and certain heights in life that require you to go to different heights in the Lord. If you want to see what God can do for you and through you, do you want to see God take you to that next level? Spend some more time in prayer. It's not, it's not that difficult, right? I mean, like, we make it harder than it is because it looks like a mountain. God wants to take you to that mountaintop experience with him. He wants to bless you there. So God's calling you to the mountain. Number two. God wants you to stop trying to climb the mountains that you're not made to climb. God says to you today, it's time to start speaking to the mountain. It's time to start speaking to that mountain. That thing that you've dealt with for years. That thing that just won't go away. It's time to stop struggling with it. And it's time to start speaking to it in Jesus' name. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of me and you if you're a believer in Christ. You have the power. You have what it takes because of what he did. So now I say to you, look, God breathed the breath of life into Adam. You have the spirit of God. Speak to that problem. I'm not going to deal with you anymore. It's time for you to get to stepping. Get out of my life. Enough is enough. It's time to put your foot down on some things. Praise God. I'd like to invite every one of you who's ready to go higher in that mountain with God, and you're ready to start speaking to the mountains that you're not intended to climb. Would you meet me in this altar this morning? Praise God.